Hello, everyone. Hello, um, Janilia. Hello, uh, EMBL. Hello, everyone. So it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Stefan Preivisch. Uh, Stefan um, studied computer science at the Technical University in Dresden and did his PhD at the Max Planck Institute of uh, Molecular Cell Biology and Genetics in Dresden in the lab of uh, Pavel Jomancek, where he was uh, working on light sheet reconstruction. And uh, he, there he also developed the uh, ImageLib2 library together with um, Stefan Selfett and Tobias um, Pritsch. In 2011, he moved, uh, Stefan moved to the US to work as a postdoctoral researcher First, uh, in the Myers lab at Janelia, with a focus on the image analysis of uh, EM datasets, and later as an uh, HSSP fellow in the lab of Robert Singer at the Einstein College in New York, where he focused his research on transcription imaging and uh, the respective datasets. Since 2015, he is a group leader um, at the Berlin Institute um, for uh, Medical Systems Biology at the Max Delbruck Center in Berlin where his lab uh, focuses on, on microscopy, image analysis, and uh, modeling of developing uh, organisms, as well as spatial um, transcriptomics. In 2019, then, um, Stefan joined Janilia as the team lead of the computational methods development section. And uh, here, his team currently um, mainly focuses on uh, large-scale image data reconstruction and analysis. Today, uh, Stefan will talk about reconstructing large-scale light sheet microscopy um, acquisitions. And uh, again, I can only say it once more, it's a pleasure to have you with us uh, right now, Stefan. Thank you for agreeing to give this presentation and uh, feel free to share your slides right now and uh, take it away. Thanks so much, Ulrike. Thanks so much uh, for the organizers to give me the chance to present in this uh, group. I, I hope it's going to be interesting. I mean, some of you have seen parts of this already, but at the same time, I added some new things that we've been uh, working on recently. And if there's some time at the end, I wanted to tell you a little bit about uh, our current pet project on spatial transcriptomics. Let's see if there's time for it or not at the end. Okay. Um, why am I talking about this? Uh, I'm convinced, and many other people too, that modern develop developmental biology um, increasingly relies on solutions for imaging large samples with high resolution. You see this nowhere more than in Janelia, where there are these large scale efforts of imaging the entire Drosophila with EM and uh, entire mouse brain of light microscopy and so on, right? I mean, it's not it's the only, but it's one of the very important fields, I believe. And examples for this can be as small as a confocal microscope that uh, takes tiled uh, acquisitions of Drosophila brain, or as I mentioned before, there's an acquisition we did here at Janay of an entire C. elegans uh, dower. And of course, these days, these acquisitions are even much bigger, right? The fly M project, I guess you heard about them, where entire uh, Drosophila brains are being acquired and reconstructed. And what is uh, kind of the focus of the talk today is light sheet microscopy, which is uh, still an emerging technology. It's not, not that new anymore, but it basically has two interesting um, applications these days, which is the well-known imaging of developing organisms, but also more increasingly imaging of very, very large expanded and cleared samples, which allows you to image very large specimens with single cell resolution and even beyond that with super resolution. And that's what I'm gonna focus on today. And the focus of this talk is reconstructing these samples. But what you at the end do with these things is segmentation, right? And that is one of the key goals of almost any of these image analysis pipelines. And this is just a very famous movie from Fernando Amat from Phil Keller's lab that we were in the same lab back in Janelia, actually, when I was here as a postdoc. And he developed this uh, still state-of-the-art tracking tool. And I'm not going to talk about these things today, but just basically put it in perspective why we're doing this reconstruction, where this eventually goes to. And of course, there's a lot of segmentation work with units with new type of architectures combining uh, also different tools of computer vision and, and at the end to make sense of this data, right? Just to make new nuclei, to trace on neurons and to do all these things. And at the end, I will just talk about two little projects that we have been involved in uh, for segmentation. But of course, it's a gigantic domain. And what I talk about here is basically the prerequisite to get all of this started. So um, of course, the microscopy has been amazing and have been making incredible advances over the last years, right? Light sheet microscopy, super resolution. But of course you need them and this is amazing. But what you also need, I argue, this is the software to actually reconstruct these samples, right? Because it's not the single confocal microscope anymore where you can just take the data that comes out of it and analyze directly. The reconstruction is a very important part of the whole uh, pipeline. So today I will focus on two 
modalities uh, of acquisition. One of them is sample clearing, which is, for example, the Clarity Protocol from the Dyson Road Lab, where you take, a, for example, a mouse brain, you will stabilize it, you will move the lipids, and you get this transparent object. And this preserves fluorescent GFP, for example. That means you can drive any line, stain all neurons in the brain, and basically image that thing at single cell resolution. Right. So this takes forever. This is a gigantic sample. Right. That's why light microscopy has become the state of the art for imaging this, not because of the superior quality or anything, usually because of the speed. Otherwise, you would sit there for days or weeks waiting for one sample to be required. This was actually done in Geneva. There's one microscope here that Nathan Clark originally developed that does that, right, with two photo microscopy. It's not that's not possible. It's just very infeasible in some sense. Uh, and there's another really cool technique, which is expansion microscopy. And this has to uh, been driven in part by Paul Tilberg, who developed these amazing techniques where you don't only clear the sample, but actually make it physically bigger. And with that, you can actually do super resolution imaging with standard microscopy, which is a really cool approach. And the data I'm going to show and work today uh, is, has been made by Fabio uh, at the NBC. And David uh, and me wrote the big stitcher in large parts. And for the expansion microscopy data is by Carol, Tim, and Paul. And Stefan Salvet and me have been working on the reconstruction of this data. So why light microscopy, right? I want to give a little bit of an introduction to light microscopy. I'm sure other talks have done this before. I'm just not sure, so just a little bit of background. So there are two types of light microscopes, and this is important for the talk, right? The one is the really classical design, that's ultra microscope developed in 1912, uh, actually in Zeiss microscopy in the company. It was an interesting story, right? When uh, Stelzer uh, published uh, and um, patented his uh, Zeiss microscope, uh, his his, his electric microscope with Zeiss. Zeiss actually didn't know that they were holding the patent for this old microscope from 2012. Somebody else found it out and told them. <laughs> so that's a, a really funny story. Anyhow, so this is the classical light design where you put your sample in front of the objective. A light sheet comes from the either side, eliminates the sample left and right, and you move your sample through the light sheet in order to take a 3D stack. You can rotate your sample, you can take Turn your sample around and actually take uh, images from different orientations doing this mode of view microscopy. So here you get normal 3D stacks, as you know, from focal microscopy out that you need to uh, reconstruct. The other type of uh, light sheet um, microscope that's becoming more common is uh, one that takes uh, not orthogonal planes, but tilted planes. And there are two major designs that do that. One of them is the dice bin like design that was originally developed in the Schroff lab, where you decouple elimination and detection, and you go at a varying angle, usually 45 degrees, but it can be varied as it makes sense for the sample acquisition purpose. And the other one is the oblique plane microscopy originally developed in the Dunsby lab. Here I show the scape microscope, actually pictures from there. And they're basically the same objective is used to create a light sheet and to acquire also an uh, approximately 45 degree angle. And these data actually come with specific challenges that I will uh, first of all talk about in a bit. But as I said, first quickly, this microscope, it's kind of clear. It's a standard 3D stacks. So you take your Prosophila brain from one side, you go over it with a scan in the stage, take 50 very large 3D stacks, 2000 by 2000 by 1000 pixels, something like that, and you cover your sample. If you want, you can actually turn it around and image it from the other side, which can be very helpful if your sample is not perfectly transparent, for example. Or if you want to increase the resolution in specific areas of it. So, but if you, look at this type of microscopy, it's actually a bit more complicated, right? Because the stacks that you get out, even the individual stacks, you can't directly process because they're acquired in a sheared manner. What does this mean, right? So because the uh, detection and elimination are not in 90 degrees, but in 45 or varying uh, um, differentiations of that, you take 3D stacks that are tilted like this, for example, 2000 by 2000 pixels. And as you move your sample through, you take stacks that are physically oriented in that way, right? And it's sometimes important to keep this in your head, what this means, right? So at the end, this, what you acquire is not a 3D rectangle. It's thought as a 3D rectangle, but it's actually something like a parallelogram, right? And the first thing you have to do is you have to unshear this data. And it's actually even worse, right? Uh, we realized with Zypher together and with the uh, Svoboda lab, and I think this holds true for most of these, that these shifts that are usually assumed to be constant are usually not. They are, for example, in average 13 pixels, the shift in X, and there should be no shift in Y, right? That's usually what the stage tells you, but this is usually not true. 
So uh, the first thing that we did is to basically develop a software that improves these reconstruction of these tilted stacks. So just to give you an example, this is data from the Soboda lab. This is how a sheared stack comes out of the microscope, right? So uh, as you can see, it moves across. It has this impression that it moves. Of course, it doesn't. What you need to do is you need to correct for the shearing. So what we do, we use uh, our old geometric local descriptor matching, which basically finds local constellations of points. Also works with any kind of sample. It doesn't have to be. It works better on pointy samples, but it also works with DAPI channels or whatever. Alternatively, we actually use SIFT. But what we do is we find corresponding points in between each plane up and down by uh, three planes. We optimize this and basically shift them back into the real orientation. And the interesting part is exactly this. You actually do have a shift in Y, a small one about 0 0.8 pixels, and you have a varying shift in X, which is more or less the 13 pixels as we expect, but it usually is not. Especially in the beginning, you have a speed up of the stage, and then you have a certain yeah, variation of that uh, speed, which is, I think, a very interesting thing to notice currently kind of ignored with these type of microscopes is you assume 13 pixels here and zero pixels here and just get started. But at the end, you end up with slightly sheared and uh, wobbly volumes, which again depends what you want to do with the images afterwards, right? If you want to just find a cell outline, that's maybe okay. But in this case, you want to do a single mode, you fish. And there it is very important actually that the beads are very uh, much on top of each other. So this is how the stack, such a stack then looks after reconstruction, right? You see now it's fixed, but actually the whole image moves, right? You have this parallelogram. So one of the downsides of how this is currently done is also that people usually create these stacks physically, right? They now make a large volume that encompasses the entire reconstructed stack. For this one, it actually goes from three gigabytes to 50 gigabytes, which is mostly black. So if you use compression, that may be okay. However, generally, this is not ideal. So uh, actually, Seifert wrote a virtual handling for these that we can on demand render these images. And this is another advantage. As I said, this is usually not integer shifts. If it would be integer shifts, being one pixel, two pixel, three pixels, wouldn't be an issue. But in order to create these stacks, you already have to interpolate the data. So the point is you don't want to do this twice. You don't want to interpolate just to create the input data, and then interpolate again later when you do the alignment. Ideally, you want to do one single interpolation step. And this is what uh, the advantage of this virtual rendering also has. First of all, it has a way lower memory footprint and it avoids uh, double interpolation of the data. Okay, with this, we have an input stack, same as from a classic microscope. And then you can stack them as well as you can do with the tiled stage. You can stack them on top of each other relative to the cover slip that is basically down here, right? And you can cover your entire field of view, even in different Z steps and in different length. And this is often also referred to as stage scanning. I think Harry Shroff uh, coined the term. And it's just a little bit different ge geometry that it takes some time to wrap your head around it. And I thought it's maybe a good uh, venue to talk about a little bit more the ups and downs of this. There are a lot of advantages to the scanning mode, right? But it also comes with additional challenges that we, I think, addressed here uh, quite elegantly. So at the end, no matter if you use the classical design or these, uh, any of these microscopes that create these sheared volumes, once you do this initial reconstruction step, you can start thinking about how to put all these stacks together into a 3D um, reconstruction. And this data is quite unique uh, from a microscopy standpoint. It's really high dimensional. You have 3D, you might have different uh, rotations, you might have different illumination directions, you might have different channels. So you often end up with six dimensional data, right? Which each of the stacks is really gigantic, usually three, four, five gigabytes, each one. And you want to be able to global, with a global solution that is robust to reconstruct this. But at the same time, you want to be able to interfere with the reconstruction if something goes wrong. Because we always learn something will always go wrong, right? So you want to have tools where you can say, okay, it gets us to 99% and the last percent I can somehow have the ability to fix if something actually goes wrong. And this is the type of approaches I will be talking on today mostly and I already did before, right? Because it's, for example, very helpful to have this virtual reconstruction of this stack. I mean, if something is wrong, you can quickly fix it, right? It's just fixing one number saying, oh, slice 17, there's something wrong. I can quickly fix this. I want to rotate the whole thing very easy, right? Because everything is just virtually computed instead of making these 50 gigabyte volumes on this. So this is how most data looks like after acquisition and 
in uh, the other case, shearing reconstruction, you have acquisitions that cover very large samples here, for example, uh, mouse hypothalamus, each of these blocks is 2000 by 2000, 1000 pixels in this case, and it covers the entire sample using uh, the classical logic microscope. And here we have an acquisition from the Keller lab, actually, uh, that is an expanded Drosophila uh, first in the larval brain. Uh, so this is a super resolution acquisition of uh, the uh, entire uh, parental nerve cord and brain of the Drosophila. So what, is the, what are the challenges uh, in reconstructing these uh, data sets? You have many, many tiles that cover a sample that you're interested in. You have to consider data handling, compute time, how to place tiles that may be empty, right? This quite often happens if you set this automatically. Uh, you have to think about robustness. And as I said about interactive reconstruction that you can interfere with the process if something goes wrong. Because what is really different in these samples is the acquisition might be very expensive, right? Pre preparing the samples is costly. You want to have the tools that even if something goes wrong, you will be able to do the reconstruction as good as possible in any case. So the general stitching problem is illustrated here. You have several tiles that overlap. This is what the stage tells you how it is. This is how it actually turns out to be. So what you need to do is you compare the computer pairwise overlaps between each of those uh, tiles for each tile. And then you find a globally optimal solution that places them as good as possible relative to each other. So we use two strategies for doing these pairwise comparisons. We either do phase correlation, which is a classic technique from the 80s or 70s, uh, which basically computes the field transform, computes this delta function, and this little spot tells you what the shift between those two tiles is. And this is quite robust, doesn't always work, but it's pretty robust. The disadvantage is that you can only do translation. That means if it's a little bit rotated, the response will not be very good and you might run into issues. But for most of the acquisitions, this gives you a reasonable start, starting point, actually. And the other approach is, as I mentioned before, to use geometrical with descriptor matching, where we find reoccurring geometric constellations of points. And these points can be anything. They can be, of course, points like fluorescent beads or single molecular fish spots, but it can also be any structures within a nucleus or it will find anything that is um, somewhat similar, right? And then based on these, you can basically find these points here highlighted in red. And um, as you can see, they're uniformly distributed across the stack. And from that, you can very robustly usually compute a pairwise overlap between two tiles. And again, we combine this with geometric or descriptive matching and auto robust outlier removal, meaning that we find only points that agree on a common transformation model, which in our case is translation or rigid or regularized affine model. So this is just a simulation um, of a 2D tile, but this is what often happens, right? You have certain islands of data that are well connected. You get nicely green corresponding uh, overlaps between this. And you have two problems. Sometimes one of them is actually wrong. So it tells you this shift is 500, 500, but it should be a thousand zero. This can happen, right? So we wrote code that tries to automatically detect those misalignments. And it will use, uh, we use a two round global optimization where it will also adhere to the metadata as much as possible, where it gives priority to the areas where you have data for alignment and for the other part of the data that's here image uh, uh, visualized in gray. It will do whatever it can, but it will basically preserve the metadata from the microscope, microscope as good as possible. And this helps you to place empty tiles. This helps you if you have, as for example here, two different objects that are in the same field of view, because otherwise it wouldn't have any means of how to put them relative to each other. This is usually important and very practical concerns, right? You have multiple uh, fields of view or you have multiple objects and then this can be very helpful. So after we have all of this connected, we do a global optimization that places all the tiles using these relative overlaps as close as possible to each other, which then gives us the final alignment. For example, using a translation model, or we can even go then to a rigid or affine model at the end, and usually end up with an error around two, three, four pixels, which is usually as good as it gets with such a large uh, acquisition. And this is how this looks, for example, in the big stitcher. Um, app. So it actually overlays these links to you. It says, okay, all the green ones, we found good correspondences between these tiles. The red ones we found automatically to be bad. And the yellow ones are the ones where the quality is low, too low. So we excluded them. 
from the reconstruction. And that's also the point where as a user, you can go in and say, okay, look, this looks weird. I want to remove that link as well because I see it's wrong, right? So you can really go in there and fix your acquisition as good as possible. You can also do it the other way around and actually move tiles to wherever you want to move them if you know better than whatever came out of the uh, automatic reconstruction. What happens in practice is this is comes out of the metadata. You do the alignment and it snaps in and as you can see, the errors are pretty high, right? These are 100 pixels or something like this. This is basically the, the reconstruction step as it usually uh, would appear to you uh, as a user of the software. So all of this is based on ImageLib2, which is a powerful framework for dealing with very large data sets. It's a generic framework that comes with caching. That means it will, like in Google Maps, for example, would only load the data at the current resolution as you need it, right? You have the entire globe on your browser, but you only load wherever you zoom in at the level that you need it, which is really helpful because the same way we view the data, the same way we process the data, right? We can nicely parallelize all these um, uh, operations that we do. We can say, okay, just find interest points in this area, just fuse that area, right? So this nicely scales to very large data sets. So currently this is all done only multi-threaded in Big Stitcher. But uh, with the new project with Zyphet and also with uh, Marvin from my old lab, the next step is to also deploy this to the cloud where you can basically scale these operations into even larger uh, uh, acquisitions and that should scale up to the petabyte range. So as a format, we use M5 for HD5. M5 is great for the cloud. Uh, Zyphet lab developed that because you can write different blocks in parallel, which is really useful, for example, when you fuse the final output image, right? Every process can fuse one little part of the data completely independently. And even fusing a one terabyte or 10 terabyte volume will be done within the matter of an hour or half an hour, depending on how many resources you uh, do in parallel. Big Data Viewer is used for visualizing this, as I showed you in the video already, this whole interactive thing. We use a lot of Apache Spark now for the cloud processing and most of the functionality that I show you today and I hope later uh, also all of it is available in Fiji as a plugin. So you can run this and I will show you at the end there's even a, there will be a cloud plugin for Fiji as well where you can access the big stitcher functionality also through your local computer on the cloud. So another, so this first part basically gives you a basic reconstruction of the sample. Often this is good enough, right? Often this is what you need to do and you can move on. However, light aberrations might become very important depending on what exactly you wanna do. So it might introduce non-rigid non deformations and there might be light degradation and bleaching artifacts that you want to correct for. So the first thing that we do in the classic light microscopy, we have left and right-sided illumination. So it's a very trivial task to select for each of these images. They're both acquired with both illuminations which one is the better one and we keep the better one. Afterwards, you can resave the data set and cut it in half, right? That's a very typical workflow as you go through Big Stitcher. In order to do that, we simply look at the local contrast and compare left and right and make a decision which one is better. You often experience spherical and chromatic aberrations. So, and there's of course a lot of literature how to do this right. What we provide here in this Big Stitcher is an approximation of that using affine models. Or, pair, uh, or blockwise affine models. So this is not the way to do it right, but it is a way to fix it as much as you can with the simple tools that you have in here. So basically what we do, this is how it looks before, right? In the corners, you see that those two channels, this out of resonance signal doesn't perfectly overlap. It should, but it doesn't, right? So what you can do is you can find corresponding interest points automatically using iterative closest point, align them. So this is all just a few clicks and usually what happens is that this is good enough to overlay the points later on. If it's not good enough, you can virtually split these images into many tiles and then run this again. And that usually gives you an approximation of the chromatic operations. You, gotta, you have to use this carefully, right? It's not the right way to do it. The right way is to actually find the model. Zyphet has done some really impressive work on this, but this is often very microscopy, microscope specific. So this is, as I said, a tool you should use carefully, but it, could improve the chromatic and spherical operations. So here, this is how the spherical operations often look like. So in the middle of the stack, everything looks fine, but at the edges, you see that the overlaps are off, especially when it comes really close to the edge. So we do the same thing. We do an affine, we find corresponding interest points only in the overlapping areas between those. And that usually fixes this to a reasonable extent. 
Again, it depends on the microscope you use, how bad these triangle operations are. But if they're in the range of one, two pixels, these uh, refinements that we offer afterwards usually help you to get things uh, into a better place. If that does not do it, and you will get the visual feedback if it does or does not, right? then you would have to consider different solutions that exist as well, but are not built into this uh, software. So another thing that we, um, interesting thing that we actually found on uh, non-rigid uh, light deformations. So especially at the boundaries of left and right illumination, we often observe that, that in a certain Z space up here, everything is aligned. And if you go down, it's not aligned anymore. So as you go through Z, there's some non-rigid deformation going on. Again, it depends on what you want to do, if this is important or not, it can be. So first of all, we asked ourselves, why exactly is that happening? And for that, we did a little simulation using ray tracing, where we simulate an image as a 3D sphere, and we simulate a refractive index map that looks like this, which kind of simulates that the refractive index inside the sample is different than outside the sample. It's something you often have in um, light microscopy, right? Because the brain is actually different than, than the surrounding media that you embedded in, although it shouldn't, right? But also ends up often being like that. So then we basically simulate light going through here. We simulate the acquisition process here on the right side. This is looking here from the side and it's looking from the top what the virtual objective sees. And as you can see, it recapitulates exactly that, right? That at some parts on the sample, the light sheets simply don't match up, yet the detection objective is able to focus on both at the same time, right? Because these objectives are made for very large distances. So both are actually um, uh, in focus. And then we use a simple non-rigid uh, alignment based on its interest points that changes this into this, right? And now it's on the top and on the bottom aligned. Another problem that often happens is uh, brightness uh, differences. So, um, and this is because I think, can we have different reasons? I think here it's often because it's bleaching because you go in a grid like way over that sample. That means when you acquire here, it has already been imaged a few times. So it's darker. So basically what we do for intensity, uh, for, for geometric transformations, you can do for intensities as well. Assuming that in the overlapping areas, because it's aligned, the intensities should be the same. And again, Zalfet there did some code for a manuscript with Corinna back in the days, and we applied the same mechanism here. So basically after applying this intensity correction, you can go from such a sample to such a sample. And another very important thing that I think is very important is uh, looking at quality. These samples are very big, right? So, and often uh, expansion is not uniform or clearing is not uniform. And you want to get a feeling for was my sample properly acquired? Do I need multi-view and all these kind of things? And of course you could go through the entire sample yourself. We do this for the EM stacks, but it's a lot of work and a lot of time, right? So ideally you want to have a little preview of that. And for that, we developed a Fourier ring correlation based approach for light sheet. So what Fourier ring correlation does, it is usually developed to measure image quality. And it does that by acquiring each image twice. And then you do a correlation in Fourier space. And at each frequency, right, at each frequency, if the correlation is high between the two images that were acquired uh, one after the other, you know, if there is correlation, it was actually image data. If there's no correlation, it was noise. And by that, you can basically plot per frequency, what the correlation between the two images is, which tells you, okay, at a certain spatial frequency, it drops below a point and that's only noise. So basically until here, I have uh, image resolution. So we took that concept of uh, Fourier ring correlation and computed this on the light sheet stacks. So we don't want to acquire every stack twice. So we did a little hack in some sense by saying, okay, the only thing we do is we take consecutive images because the points of front is really that high that this is a good enough measure of um, contrast or quality, better quality, in order to get feedback on the entire sample. So here you see one stack, A, B, C, D, E, F, that goes in depth through the sample. So in the beginning, you have nothing, right? There's just uh, camera noise. And this was actually a problem because the Fourier ring correlation would give you a high correlation here because you have the same artifacts from the next slides to the one before. So we developed a relative Fourier ring correlation that basically uh, removes these artifacts uh, from the computation. So what we get at the end is this black curve. Basically no image here, the deeper you go in, 
beautiful quality, right? Beautiful quality. And the deeper you go, quality goes down. And you have this little artifact here, which was uh, actually not in the picture. Oh, it's this one here, right? You see this little artifact here, which is sharp, but this can happen really. But this is the type of uh, curve that you get back. This is actually pretty quick to compute. So we can compute this on the entire stack in small blocks. And here you see one uh, acquired image in magenta, the quality overlaid onto the green sample. And I hope you agree that this gives you a really reasonable estimation of the image quality. So at this level, you don't need it, right? You could just go to the stack. It's even more interesting if you acquire this, at the, if you visualize this as very big resolutions. Here, for example, a mouse brain image from the left and from the right side. And as you can see, right, you would want to combine those two. Right, the quality really decreases from the left to the right as expected and from the right to the left on the other one. You can compute the same thing once you fused your sample from the left and right illumination and you basically see that after that the image quality is homogeneously distributed. And again this is just a search tool right if in some parts of the sample the quality is not high you then go in and check what the heck went wrong there right but it gives you a hint of where to look. So now I wanted to show you some results. Oops. So this is a, a, the hypothalamus, the mouse brain section image in the beginning that I showed uh, the colorful images of in the very first slides. So as you can see, you get nicely single cell resolution throughout the entire mouse brain. But you can also acquire different samples. So for example, here we acquired OSC elegance Dower with multi-tile, multi-view microscopy that actually allows you to uh, distinguish uh, the nuclei much better than if you take the same image of confocal microscopy, simply because you have this multi-view deconvolution of these samples. Here, for example, we applied this to a, to a, to a zebrafish. It's like a 48 hours uh, post-fertilization. And this technique is really good if you are searching for something, right? You know, somewhere in my sample, I expect some abnormality and I don't know where. That is the point when you want to image your entire sample with high resolution, for example. And this is, was also the case here. So this uh, is a cancer lab. So they looked at where do specific tumors migrate to after they develop, right? And then you have just no idea where. But in order to do that, you actually have to image the entire sample with high resolution. And the cool thing is that you get the entire thing actually with a single cell resolution. Scanning took only about an hour for this type of uh, samples. This is the beautiful... Um, sample of the Drosophila first instalable brain. So reconstructed uh, from the eight times expanded microscope, uh, uh, eight times expanded sample acquired in Philip Keller's lab, I think by Ragav actually, I wasn't kind of edited by Ragav, yes. Uh, and here's the sample that I showed before from the um, Soboda lab, so Tim Van, basically looking at single molecule fish staining through an entire large section of the mouse brain. And again, this is all uh, interactively rendered using uh, Big Data Viewer, ImageLib, N5, and uh, these frameworks that we use in order to reconstruct the samples and to get this type of uh, access to the data. And usually the reconstruction quality is pretty decent, right? And as I said, Big Stitcher usually gives you the opportunity to go in there and fix things if something is not as you expect. I didn't talk about this today, but it actually does generalize the time series data. All the alignment tricks that we use here, we can just as well use over time, for example, for this Pariale embryo that was acquired by, Pas by, by Tassos, who was in Jamelia in the days that he actually did this data. And of course, it does not only work on large data, it also works on small data, right? It's also a nice tool to take a 200 megabyte confocal data set and reconstruct it because it's all interactive, it's all automatic, and it will make this process usually much, much easier. Big Stitcher and all these things that I showed, except for the shear data set that is not in there yet, is available to the Big Stitcher update site. There's also an associated paper with that where you can read a bit more of the details, and we keep expanding on this, right? So uh, there's documentation that's put Big Stitcher in that gets you started, and if you want certain features that you think you're really interested in, just shoot us an email and we can also prioritize one thing over the other, right? For example, I have the feeling that this shield sex is quite interesting to many people. So I would also prioritize over the next month to try to put something like this in there, but just let us know what, what you think is more important. Another thing we're currently working on, as I mentioned, is uh, putting things on the cloud. 
So this is Marvan Zwinki in my lab uh, in Berlin. So this is still running to September. So this is all going to end uh, rather soon, but uh, we still want to push this out. This basically replaces the big stitcher with a big distributor, which is in some sense the same thing. The only difference it is that you can hold the data actually on Amazon S3 and you don't have to have the data locally. And you can actually do processing on Amazon EMR using Spark. That means all the registration and fusion can be done locally or in the cloud, depending on how you want to do it. And you have access through Big Data Viewer to Zyphon Step with a lot of work making the M5 S3 reader people at uh, Handle also. I think, I don't know even which code Marvan ended up using. And the cool thing is also like once you have M5 on the cloud, you can also then use things like NeuroGlancer easily to look at the data that you reconstructed, right? Which is also becoming one of the quasi standards for sharing data and for looking at this on the cloud. So this is kind of the way this whole universe is moving and we will also add more support for other data sets in the future. And let me look at the clock, okay, 9.40. So I wanted to um, mention two little projects that basically built on top of this uh, for segmentation and uh, quality um, estimation, which I think are neat and maybe they're useful to you. So we developed this RS FISH, stands for Radial Symmetry FISH, so fluorescent in situ hybridization. So we basically take the concept of radial symmetry that intersects all the local vectors around each single molecule fish spots in order to robustly find them. We combine this with radial symmetry that finds vectors that point somewhere else, that is able to distinguish points that are very close to each other, and I think most importantly has a very, very user-friendly UI that allows you to set these parameters interactively. So if you want, for example, to find the single molecule fish spots, everything's interactive. You change the sigma, you change the parameter of the radius symmetry until this looks as you expected, right? This is not the best ever detection algorithm, but we think it's one of the most useful in the sense that you can tune this interactively for your sample. And then this is implemented using Spark then you can run this on very large volumes automatically locally on your cluster or on the cloud. So all this code is there and it really scales nicely to terabyte size data sets like, for example, the ones from Tim Wang that you that I showed before that contain a lot of single molecule fish uh, detections. So here, this is a uh, bioarchive right now. Then there are two repositories, the RS Fish. You can also just, this again, a Fiji plugin and the RS Fish Spark, which is a command line based tool to run this on very large data sets. The other uh, is a really cool project here at Janelia, uh, uh, run mostly by Srini and Jakob uh, Marke. And Habib did a lot of uh, work for this in Outdoor Spicer right now. And this is actually going towards using deep learning in order to do single molecule fish detection, also in very large volumes. And this is something you have uh, might have seen, especially at the NBL, right? There was the used uh, this type of uh, network, um, the variation autoencoder networks that uh, basically do unsupervised training on single, single uh, super resolution localization microscopy, where it basically outperformed everything. And uh, initial results show that similar things we expect actually for single molecule fish detections. So this, uh, I think, will come out uh, hopefully soon as an alternative tool to, to do single molecule fish detection. And uh, this is just an initial result actually on Tim Wang's data. And this looks really promising, these type of deep learning techniques also for single molecule fish detection. And the last thing I wanted to mention is the Fourier ring correlation. I mentioned in the middle that we use this in order to just visualize how uh, the sample quality is distributed across the stack. And here we then made a little Fiji plugin that runs on simple 3D stacks, but with the goal to help you choosing the right clearing protocol. So this is something we actually realized in the process. Clearing is such a messy business. Millions of protocols exist, millions of samples staining techniques. And you have to combine all of this together to get one nice image of your sample. Not every clearing technique works with every staining, not every sample works with every clearing technique and so on and so on, right? So often you end up trying tens or even hundreds of protocols and it's really hard sometimes to compare these results. And the Fourier ring correlation quality estimation, the FRCQE, automatically computes these scores for you. So you put in the image of a sample and it gives you comparable vol uh, uh, values in order to efficiently estimate which protocol you should use uh, for sample clearing. This is again a tool to just help you. Okay, uh, with this, I'm at the end. I want to thank a lot of people. Um, so I still have my lab, as I said, so I want to thank the people there, David, Marwan, Friedrich, Ella, Laura, Leo, who helped. 
a lot of people here at Jamea that contributed to these uh, projects as I showed today. Most importantly, Stefan Seifert, Tim Wang, Carol making the data for the light sheet stuff. Eric helped me a lot as usual. Kyle contributed, Mark and Habib, as I mentioned. Then of course, uh, Srini, Jakob, Arthur Speiser, and all the other people that helped with the light sheet data, Albert, Nadine, Paul, Raga, Philip. And of course, also to be a speech, the whole Fiji image, the tool universe. And yeah, with that, I'm happy to take some questions if you have any. So thank you very much, uh, Stefan, for the very insightful, uh, nice presentation. So are there questions? Um, so if you have questions, feel free, as I said, to use the raise hand feature and uh, I, will, um, uh, I will call you out. So um, Robert, please, your first question. Yeah, hi, um, hi, Stefan. Very nice talk and hey. I'm sure these are great tools that many people will appreciate. So I have a question towards the first part of the talk about the unshearing of this um, OPM, oblique plane, um, data and I'm sure you're aware very often not just the stage is scanned but also the illumination is scanned across the sample with Galvo mirrors and in that situation often depending on the implementation you don't only have the problem that maybe the planes are not equally separated but that even the angle slightly changes across the volume so can you think of a way to also incorporate that into your tools? Ooh, that's, a, that's a tough one right because Right now, yeah, we assume that the planes are parallel, right? That's, that's an underlying assumption right now. And the best would be to have an example, to be honest, right? To, to get a feeling for this. I mean, Seifert has done most of the work on this actually. So maybe he has some uh, insights too, but I think I would love just to play around with an example where that happens, right? Because it's definitely harder to, to then space this, right? Like, but I think, yeah, I don't know. It would be, in the, it would be just exciting to look at this, right? I, I can't really say something now. It should be possible, but yeah, if we if we have some of that data, I'm I'm sure to send it to you. So I think software technically it's no problem at all. I, I currently don't really see how you would estimate it. Yeah. From from, from would, what's yeah. you would have to have a very, very good beat sample and at least some assumption of that it follows some radial function or mm -hmm. but if it wiggles back and forth. I think with beat data, one could give it a shot just to get a feeling for maybe even if the PSF angle changes and it doesn't change, maybe that can give you some hints of, it's definitely an interesting problem. <laughs> yeah, I would hope that if you sample densely enough, right, then out of sort of um, sparsely distributed beat sample or so, maybe you should be able to compute it back, yeah. But it was just a thought because very often, it's not just the stage that scans, but it's actually also the illumination. And then there are multiple additional problems that can come into play. Well, if you, if you have an example, it would be great. Like, uh, because then we could just look at it and maybe we say, uh, no, <laughs> or maybe there is some, we have some idea of what we could do with this. Yeah, no, if, I, if we happen to get it, I'm, I'm sure to send it. Thanks. That would be cool, thanks. Okay, so are there more questions? Otherwise, I have one. <laughs> ah, no, Christian. Uh, yeah, Christian, please. Hi, Stefan. Thanks. Uh, Hi. The fish stuff, is, does that somehow work already for very big images, like whole tissues, like where you have 30 by 30,000 pixels or something? Yes. Yes. So, uh, what, so there was this paper here, the Easy Fish paper from Janelia, and there they containerized Tim, Tim's old MATLAB code uh, that also somehow works. I think they don't do a good <laughs> job in the overlapping parts. We just kind of stick these things together to get a, a process. But the code that we wrote based on the RS Fish does that, yes. And it can, it's, it's, it's completely sparkable. So once you find your parameters, in the image a macro, right? You use the N5 opener, you open a small part, adjust the parameters. Once you have them, you can just run it with Spark on a large volume that works on your workstation or you can run it on the cloud as well, if you know how to run Spark on the cloud. Mm -hmm. So, or, or on your cluster. So this works, yes, I tried it. It's, uh, I, can, I can also help you do this, so if okay, you Okay, yeah, so we don't have so much Spark experience, but uh, yeah, maybe, okay. And, and so, just that's... So, yeah. You, you, you actually don't have to. The only thing you have to do is MVN clean install and then run the command line thing. And at least that way you can do it locally on a powerful workstation. And that's usually enough because it's very fast. It doesn't take long. 
the, the, the hard part is to, 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 to just go through the big chunks of memory and you just set a block size of 512, 512, 512, and even a workstation will be done in a few hours with a large data set, I think. Okay. You know, so running this locally is really straightforward. This, this is just a command line call of the Java executable. And do you know, does that like work well with stuff like Starfish for all the decoding later? So this is really just the basic functionality of localizing the spots. So okay. it saves a CSV with all the points. Okay. And what I still wanted to add is a tool that basically, as I did in one of the videos, right, that overlays these tools onto the data that you can later look with big data view in these large volumes. That's just look good. That's what I still wanted to add. But that's yeah. also where I would draw the line and say that's, that's how far this tool goes. Okay, thanks. Sorry, uh, Daniel? Hi, yeah, I was wondering, uh, you have all these great tools. Is there like an ecosystem to link them all together in a, you know, analysis pipeline that go all the way from de-skewing, stitching, deconvolution? Uh, what's, what, what's the easy path for doing that? I mean, the easiest path for doing this right now is Big Stitcher because there we put all of this in, but now we add a lot of new things and they're not in there yet. So uh, it's actually a good question. Are we going to do this in the future? If we going to put this all into Big Stitcher, are we going to come up with a new command line based set of tools? I assume we will do both, right? Because both have their advantages depending on for the skill set of the user, right? A biologist who is maybe not that experienced in running things command line based, they might appreciate the UI, whereas somebody who is a bit more skilled on the command line might appreciate the extended set of parameters and interactivity, and not interactivity, but basically set of possibilities. And you can still say, okay, at that step, spin now up Big Stitcher. I want to change a few things and then save it again. And so, but right now, yeah, certainly, it's certainly only Big Stitcher. Really helpful to be able to debug what's going wrong and but also have a lot of stuff automated so that you're not constantly plugging away and doing this all manually. Yeah. Yeah. So, that's the way we're going right now, a combination of both. So before I did only the UI, but uh, Zalvid was a big fan of these command line tools and I grow on them as well, because it's really, both of them together have a nice, you know, as you said, right? In specific steps, you might want to go in and just change something. You know, sometimes you don't want to freak it with the parameters and you can just move it over by five pixels and that solves it. You know, <laughs> like, and that, that can happen quite often actually, especially if a complicated sample, something moved or you want to, draw a mask and say, ignore that part or, you know, stuff like that. And these things are there, but it's going to take more effort. So for example, the unshearing right now only lives in some repository in the Seifeld lab, hot knife. It's at least on the master branch right now, but uh, that will take some time. But uh, for the, personally speaking, I will invest, I hope to invest more time after my fly AM deadline <laughs> end of May is over to, to, to bring this more into a shape that also other people than just this Roboda lab can benefit from that. But again, any input is more than welcome. For example, as I said, tell us or tell me or Zyfeld what is more important, right? What should we focus on? What do, what do people really need? So my feeling is, as I said, that this unshearing can be very powerful, right? So we could put some emphasis on this in terms of what do we do when. Yeah, that would be helpful for stuff we're doing, yeah. Okay, are there more questions? As I said, because I, I actually do have another question. So you, you were quite frequently talking about uh, the image quality and also um, Fourier ring correlation uh, as if that's kind of uh, one and the same. <laughs> so I think it's like, I think a Fourier ring correlation coefficient or the analysis of an image uh, with that type of um, strategy gives you one indication or one hint uh, for image quality. Image quality is kind of a big thing to my mind. And I think it, it it's, is, also, yeah. it's also very experiment dependent it's it's very microscope dependent because uh if you base image quality on this parameter every wide field image would have would be like a very bad image right <laughs> although it fulfills a specific purpose uh for specific biological questions so um therefore uh, first of all how would you in general define image quality and um i mean yeah and how do you see in general, like that people uh, use maybe just only the Fourier ring uh, coefficient as a, as a sign for image quality? Just maybe a few that's, words. That's, that's a really nice question. And I actually started reading up on this literature when we published this FSC based uh, 
uh, uh, software. And this is a gigantic universe image quality, which dates back mostly to TV in the 1970s, right? When they wanted to basically say if you receive the TV signal, good or bad. And it, it's very context dependent. There are a lot of machine learning tools right now that try to predict this. It's, it's just a gigantic universe. And it's hard to say what is the right thing. It's always context dependent. That's what I take back from that, right? So for example, what we were interested in does the clearing work reasonably well. I think then the Fourier ring correlation is a good approach and can answer that. But for many other questions, even deep learning might be the right way to go, right? If we say, is that specific feature visible? Which, like for your encouragement, will not tell you that, right? Like if you look for something specific that you want to be, have resolved or even some pattern matching might be useful. Or if, if you want, I can send you, there's a really nice review on that uh, image quality, future goals and challenges. It's, it, it's a huge field. And I also just started appreciating that once I started reading on it. But uh, there's not a simple answer to this. But if you want, I can share that, uh, that review. That's, yeah. that's the CVML talk I gave some time ago on this, like where, where, where I also rushed a little bit over the current state of the art, because this is very important for everything, right? For autofocusing and iPhones and everything, right? There are like so many things where this is relevant. Yeah, I'm, I'm just only bringing this up because sometimes I'm afraid when, when people hear oh, that's a good number, they optimize for this, although they, the rest looks pretty bad. So it, it's always, it always uh, it's really actually quite important that people, as you've mentioned, put this into context and don't really uh, uh, define their image quality uh, settings based on one specific number. Because I think you know what I mean, I know what I mean, but when people read about this, they might completely uh, put this out of context. Uh, unfortunately, that's why I'm kind of bringing this and, up. And it's interesting, the state of the art is still manual uh, inspection to say what is a good and what is a bad image. But again, this depends on what you want to resolve yeah. from it, yeah. right? Like, for example, look at these uh, microscopes where you do artificially engineered point spread functions, right? Maybe some metric will tell you that's a horrible image, but it's exactly what you want, right? Because in order to localize that spot, that's exactly what you need. So, yeah, I, I think this is, yeah, I shouldn't generalize that much, you're right. So what we used it for is really just to give you a hint of where might your sample have deficiencies, right? That's, that's, that's what we used it for. And later on, we tried to frame it in the context of organoids, but yeah, this is a complex topic and not an easy one. <laughs> No, yeah, but uh, thank you for uh, your comments on this. Are there more questions? Because uh, otherwise, uh, Robert, do you maybe want to say uh, a few words to uh, the upcoming uh, talk? Um, so on June 8th, we will have Virginie Ullmann presenting, and um, she's a group leader at the e EMBL EBI, so in Hingston, in uh, England, and she works on tools, mathematical models, basically, to... Um, to to help image processing, you know, for basically segmenting and yeah, analyzing the content of bioimages. So, uh, yeah, so thank you very much for um, the announcement. So um, we are very much looking forward to see you then uh, all again in one month. So thank you again, Stefan, for your for your nice presentation. And um, yeah. Thanks so see much for the invitation. It was yeah, a pleasure. And see you all in June. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.